Welcome back to another Terranscapes video. I'm Mike and I will be your host today. And I want to welcome viewers, especially new viewers. If you're new to the channel, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. And if you are new, then you might be interested in going back and seeing the playlist uh, that is the tour of Innsmouth. Uh, this uh, project is based on a Lovecraft story, the um, Shadow Over Innsmouth. And today I'm going to be discussing some of the uh, start of the work on the Sherabang. And in the past, I've been calling it a Sherabank, which is incorrectly, or Sherabank, which is definitely incorrectly pronounced. It is a Sherabang. And even though it's a British word, I don't understand that spelling and pronunciation. Somebody in the comments probably will illuminate all of us. So check them out. And that is an open topped vehicle like a bus that is used to carry passengers for touring. Uh, and it goes quite a ways back in history, uh, horse drawn, that sort of idea. And so since the story, A Shadow Over Innsmouth, has a bus that is carrying our protagonist to the town of Innsmouth, I decided to modify that into my steampunk theme. And so this will be a Sherabang that is functionally fitting that part of the story. And in this video, I'm going to show you the work I've done on the styrene wheels and the, and the spokes for them. And I'm going to include um, some discussion about the jig that I made out of Sculpey to help align those spokes. And I know I'm going to get people who have, have in the past commented, there's been a few, and probably will comment on this video about why I'm not making them out of, um, you know, using a laser cutter or using a 3D printer to print them. I like the challenge of making them from scratch. I know that there are going to be some skills that I'm gaining, I have gained, from this process that will be applied to other parts of the project. And I also have a little fondness for tradition. I mean, scratch building is the origins of miniature art. There, there weren't 3D printers all the time for you youngins out there. Uh, they used to just have a pile of stuff and then try to figure it out. I definitely want to preserve some of that tradition and really improve my own skills. So. It is all going to be done by hand. It is all going to be done from scratch, start to finish, as long as it takes. So that's the process, and hopefully you find something about it interesting along the way as well. I do want to mention that this is the first video that I have done in a new style, which you will see. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that, and we should finally get over, get over to the bench in the past, because I already shot it, and see the work that I've done. So I've been doing uh, work on the wheels, and what I did, and I think you can see it here, is I ended up laminating three uh, thin strips of styrene, 0.015 maybe. And so uh, by laminating them, I was able to get a circle that wouldn't have um, a flat spot. Now you can see right here that there is a little bit of a, of a spot where it tried to kind of get flat on the inside, but by putting three layers together, that was uh, severely reduced. And one of the things that happened as well is that the layers uh, didn't really quite uh, stack evenly. So you can see here how the center of this ring is a little recessed, so those three layers weren't quite even. So what I've done is I have uh, filled them in with uh, uh, squadron green putty, and that was a nice choice because it dries really quickly and it's easy to sand. So I could fill it, and then I sanded it, then I filled it again, and then I sanded it again. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but the way I made them was to cut a hole in a piece of hardboard with a hole saw, and then use that hole as the frame to uh, wrap the pieces into that hole to get the circle. And that worked out pretty well. And I should mention um, a little quickly about the sanding. One of the uh, problems is that uh, styrene scratches very, very easily. And I discovered a little while back that if you go to a high enough grit, you can get it pretty smooth. So I ended up sanding it on uh, 600 grit, uh, 1200 grit, then I went to 2000. And then I went to 3000 and 3000 really isn't enough to get it super smooth, but uh, that's, I think, smooth enough because the sides of the rims. So this is uh, silicon carbide paper 
and this is the only way you can get grits this high. I have a whole selection. Um, I actually have 7,000 and 5,000, and I decided that 3,000 would be enough. And my thinking is that on the edges, so basically, right, I was just doing a little on it, and the rims on their edges uh, will look pretty smooth because I'm going in a circular motion and because the wheels are rotating right they can get scrapped. One advantage I have on this process is that the share bank in the story is described as a, I don't know a rat trap rickety thing. I can't remember the exact wording. So there are few imperfections in the the circle's shape and there's also going to be some uh, deformations on the uh, wheel and there are a few uh, dents or areas where I scraped with the knife that caused a little, well, you kind of see a little bit right there, I think. And so I figured um, I get some leeway because it's okay if the wheels have some, uh, some chips and dents and things like that since it's an old vehicle that looks borderline sound. One of the things I wanted to mention uh, before I get back to work here is that this is the uh, my first attempt at making a jig for arranging the spokes. And so this is uh, Super Sculpey, and I was thinking I would form the jig, and then I could pull these pieces out, bake it, and then I would have guides to lay in the spokes and also where the wheels should be. Uh, I First, I'll just say I think I'm going to make two separate ones because I want the back spokes to be thicker and to have fewer of them. And so I won't be able to use the same jig for both of the rear and front wheels. But just as a little warning, I ended up leaving the styrene when I took my break. I ended up leaving the styrene in the Super Sculpey thinking, ah, it'd be fine. You know, I'll get back to it later. And when I pulled it out, I noticed that the styrene was kind of stuck in the Super Sculpey. I was like, wait a minute, you know, so it's like... And I thought, oh, well, it's just kind of settled into it. Uh, no, it hasn't actually. It has melted the styrene and deformed it. And you can see it more clearly on this rear wheel, which I have not cleaned up yet. And if you look at the bottom, you can see, you know, around here that this is, this is melted. This is uh, like doubled over on itself here. This is starting to puddle almost in the Super Sculpey. So, uh, yeah, don't leave it in the Super Sculpey for too long, uh, unbaked, because it actually will eat styrene. I did not know that, nor did I expect that. So I feel quite lucky, actually, that I was able to get the wheels out of it uh, and still have them be functional, because that would have been a big setback to have to try to make those all again, especially because I think I threw out the mold for it. Mm -hmm. So um, this gives you an idea of what I'm about to do. Once I get um, a little bit further along, we'll come back and we'll take a look at it. So once I have the new uh, uh, jig uh, created for the small wheels, I'll start putting in their spokes and then I'll have to create a, a different jig for the larger wheels. But right now I got to clean up that other wheel and we'll come back when I'm a little further along.
So I wanted to show you the uh, jig for the spokes. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm making it in Super Sculpey. Uh, my original thought was that I would bake this and then have a, you know, a stronger form uh, to do both wheels on. But since I'm changing the plan for having the rear wheels have different spoking, can I do that? That uh, I'm not going to bake this, I don't think. But it, it's quite stiff, so it works well. I have some other clay I could have used, uh, but I already have this out, so I figured I'm just going to work with that. One thing um, that I'm doing, so I don't know if you can see, um, is that right here, there's a couple little indents. And um, these are measurements from my protractor. Uh, I have an INCRA, I might as well show you. This is an INCRA rules protractor. This thing is the bomb. And um, it has uh, markings as you move away from these lines to help you strike uh, distances. I don't really care what the measurements are per se, but I wanna have the circle centered on the center point. So I marked those on the uh, Super Sculpey, and then I'm eyeballing the distance to fit it. Uh, that's um, the easiest way I can think of to get close without trying to break out a compass and mark things. and. Uh, because once I put a compass in it, it starts to distort and then things go out of whack anyway. So uh, that's how I've arrived at this point. Now, one of the things is that um, if you try to make a, m a mark in any clay, right, and I press it in and I strike it, all right, that creates a little dimple. And if I want to make it wider and I want to put them close to each other, all right, it starts to create a distortion and that is going to possibly, right, they push into each other or uh, the, the bottom surface is uneven or whatever. So um, when you are uh, trying to create channels in clay, it is much better to have a tool that actually removes the clay from it rather than just push it aside. And uh, because of the size I'm working with, I don't actually have any clay shapers that do that, but because of the very small uh, uh, size of the channels, I made my own. This is out of some wire ribbon uh, that I have. And originally it was for making um, uh, atomizers for e-cigs. I won't get into that, uh, but it's a little thin uh, ribbon wire. And I bent it around the tip of a toothpick, made a little square edge. And then now I can draw it along the clay and I can remove clay so that it doesn't distort the outside edges. And that way um, the channel stays true. So that's what I've been doing uh, to make this form as it is. The last piece I need to do here is create the channel that accepts the wheel such that the wheel sits where sits down into the clay deep enough that when I lay the spoke across, that the spoke meets the inside of the wheel in its midpoint and also meets the hub on the inside at its midpoint. So um, I need to continually remove some clay and test it. Uh, and I think uh, I'm going to get a spoke out and lay it down there. And then I can use that as a bit of a guide uh, to see how close I am to the midpoint. Does it have to be perfect, perfect? No, but it needs to be pretty close. Uh, and then once I have the hub recessed as well, which is um, slightly deeper than the uh, wheel so that it will protrude on both sides, then I can, uh, and I might need to go back and clean these up a little bit. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. That cat hair. <laughs> um, well, I might need to cut some extra. I only well, need four, and I cut extras. But you can see this one was sitting in the Super Sculpey too long, and then it got um, a little melted. In any case, I will need to uh, cut, cut that, recess that in the center as well. So what I'll do uh, very likely is I'm going to put some spokes in, just lay them down, and then I can place the uh, hub and have it just touching all these spokes and I'll know that the hub is centered and then I press it into the clay to get its actual uh, dimensions and then I can come in and remove material so that the hub sits down as well and a little bit deeper than the wheel. Uh, so that's the process uh, I've been working on and it's been going fairly well actually and I will uh, do some more removal and I might clean up a couple of the spoke channels. I'll have to see to make sure that they're a little bit more uniform.
Hopefully you enjoyed that look and you liked the new format. Uh, you'll be seeing similar structure for the upcoming videos. So it took a little while to get this video out. There was a little gap, yeah, mm -mm. but I haven't ever shot all of the footage for a couple videos together like this before. And there was some pre uh, front loading, I should say, in terms of getting a few more skills down in Premiere Pro about editing, because there was quite a bit of, of footage to, to kind of piece out. And I'm not used to working with that many clips and, and files and also doing some of the work for setting up the cameras. And I still have a little more work to do uh, coming up, but um, that's why there's some things hanging here. And I don't know if you can see them. This, that's the whole, the uh, camera above. And uh, that bar may never be moved, never, because it's in the right spot. And I don't want to have to try to set it up every time. So no, it doesn't get touched. Nobody touch it. If you like this new format, uh, you might consider becoming a patron and helping to support the work that I do in making these videos. And you can find the link to Patreon down below. And I'll put a link over here, I think, at the end of the video. And lastly, I want to thank you so much for joining me. And hopefully I will see you in part two of this series because you know that I will be back soon with another Terrence Gapes video.